How many times has Rome been sacked anyway? In the third century BC, a group of Gauls called the Senwans was growing. Their increasing number was too much for the surrounding land to bear. So the entire tribe packed up and they headed south across the Alps and then through Tuscany. They came across the Etruscan city called Cluisium. And intending to take over the surrounding land, they besieged it. Panicked, the leaders of the city sent out cries for help to the surrounding countryside. And who should answer their plea but their ambitious neighbor to the south, the Romans. Now, Rome was not yet a great empire, but they were a growing power. And this seemed like a great opportunity to welcome a new client city into their fold. The Romans sent out three ambassadors to negotiate with the besieging Gauls. And the Gallic chief, Brennus, welcomed them in with the honor and dignity that was befitting to their station. The Romans, however, showed no such respect back. The Romans chided him for his conquest. What had this city ever done to him to deserve such treatment? Angered at their hypocrisy, Brennus pointed out that the Romans had conquered all of their neighbors just for their spoils. And as for what the city of Clusium had done to him, they insulted him. For while his people starved, they had more food than they could eat and more gold than they could spend. Having failed at their diplomatic mission, the ambassadors should have just gone home. But instead they went into the city of Clusium and rallied its people to fight back. That action broke their oath as diplomats to remain neutral. When Brennus had heard that the Romans had dishonored their ancient customs of diplomacy, that betrayal enraged him. That night he gathered up everybody and they marched south. They cut their way through the countryside, but they left the fields and cattle, the farms and villages untouched. When his officers asked him why he wasn't pillaging these areas, he said, no, we march only for Rome. The few legions sent out to protect Rome were not yet the mighty force of legend. And at the Battle of Alia, the Roman army was shattered by the Gauls on the banks of the Tiber. Only a few soldiers managed to escape and go back and warn the helpless city. All the men of fighting age were to retreat into the fortified keep at Capitoline Hill, and all the others that could were to flee. But the sick and the elderly, they were left to die. In a showing of dignity and solidarity, a few elder statesmen and retired counselors went down and opened the gates to the city and sat in the open forum and waited for the Gauls and for death. And the Gauls did come. They sacked and looted and burned for days. Then they surrounded and laid siege to Capitoline Hill, knowing that the men inside only had a few days to either submit or starve. Eventually, a truce was brokered. Brennus and the Gauls would leave the city, but the Romans would have to pay him tribute. His demand, a thousand pounds of gold. When the day of reckoning came, Brennus himself stood by the scales as the gold was brought in and the payment was weighed. But soon there were whispers among the Romans. Something was off. The Gauls were trying to get more than what they bargained for. The weights they were using were too heavy. Brennus heard their complaining. He walked over to the scales, reached out his hand, and dropped his sword on the balance, tipping the scales even more to his favor, and said, Ve Victus! which means woe to the conquered. The subtext being, what are you gonna do about it? I run my game pretty much that way. I ran that same situation for my home group uh, a couple weeks ago. They really hate that orc chief now. I use third person indirect dialogue. That is, that whole time I only spoke one line in character. The rest of the time I sort of gave a description, a general outline of what was being said and conveyed the speaker's thoughts and emotions. But first, we need to go over some semantics, because a lot of people are using the technically incorrect terminology. Even the player's handbook gets this wrong by saying there's only two types of role playing, active and description, when in reality there are four. So let's get everyone on the same page. First person direct is, I walk up to the barkeep and say, it's gonna be a long one, might as well keep them coming. First person indirect is, I walk up to the barkeep, I make some small talk with him and ask for another drink. Third person direct is, Tormin walks up to the barkeep and says, it's gonna be a long one, might as well keep them coming. Third person indirect is, Tormek walks over to the bar, makes some small talk and asks for another drink. So we can see that players can speak in four different ways, but DMs can only speak in two. That is, even when a DM is using direct dialogue, they're always speaking in third person because they're the narrator. So when talking about how we role play, a lot of people say they're using third person, when what they really mean is they're using indirect dialogue. And this is actually an important distinction. I'm not just arguing semantics. There is a reason 
whether or not a player would speak in first person or third person, and that is independent of whether or not they're using a character voice. And we'll get to why that's important later on in the video. Whenever this discussion comes up, the common answer is, it's okay if you don't speak in character. Of course, the implicit assumption there is, or the implicit criticism is, that speaking in character is somehow better, that it's the preferable option, but if you don't, you know what, that's fine too. That's ridiculous. That's sort of akin to saying, well, you really should be playing a wizard, but if you like the fighter, that's okay too. People are allowed to have fun in different ways. So of course, I'm gonna try to argue the opposite. I'm gonna try to say that using indirect third person roleplay is good for your game. It has real benefits. I'm gonna give you some tips on how to do it better. And then I'm gonna give, I don't know, I guess kind of a hack. I know, okay, I know hack is kind of like a buzzword, but in this case, I think it really does apply. It's more akin to Mike Merrill's version of a hack. I'm gonna use a system of the rules in a way that weren't intended to get a, a cool outcome, a, a cool and useful outcome. Okay, so this is the most interesting bit, so it's gonna go first. We're all in agreement now that DMs, when they're speaking, they always speak in third person. But what about players? I think most players tend to favor either first person or third person, but I'm gonna go ahead and say that all players actually engage in both and they do so for different reasons at different times. Almost everybody is in first person when they do combat, for example. I attack the goblin, I run up the hill and throw my spear down. But sometimes a player who primarily plays in first person will switch to third person or vice versa. Why do we do this? What's going on here? This is something I never really considered until I started doing research for this video. So my conclusion is this. Now go ahead and let me know when I'm wrong in the comments below. But my thought is that players who tend to speak in first person, their character is an extension of their ego. They're playing some version of themselves. A completely different version of themselves, but it's still a part of them. In some ways, they are that character. It might be a different version of themselves, one with more power, one with less scruples, but still it's, a, it's an alter ego of sorts. They are thinking, what would I do in this situation if I were more something? In contrast, a player who defaults to third person is playing a character that's much different than themselves. It's, uh, it's not their psyche in the character. They're really trying to explore another person's point of view and perspective. And by using third person, they're purposely getting distance. They're removing themselves from this character and they're letting that be known. This character is not them. It's this different persona entirely. And this is something I just realized when making this video that I do a whole lot. I default to third person role playing because I tend to play characters that are very different than myself. They have different psychologies and different values. And I default to third person to really emphasize and show that off. Now, it becomes important when a player switches from first person to third person because they're trying to communicate something, even if they're doing it subconsciously. You'll see this a lot. A player will spend like 90% of their time describing their character's actions in first person. I light a torch, I approach the barkeep. But then sometimes they'll switch to third person. AC walks over and reads the book. They're doing this when they're trying to make it explicit that this is what their character would do, not themselves. They'll use third person to convey that they're doing something that's against their own self-interest or that they know is suboptimal, but it fits what that character is trying to do. You see this all the time in Critical Role, especially with uh, Marisha and Keyleth and Sam Regal and everything he does. And of course, just as a note, I think combat is the major exception to this. I think everyone defaults to first person in combat because combat tends to be more about the players. But there are of course major exceptions and that's when we add the dramatic elements to combat. Now when I DM, I use indirect dialogue, except for when I don't. What I mean by that is like 80% of the time when I'm giving dialogue, it's something like this. The Smith reluctantly tells you he got the iron from a shady dealer. He looks really ashamed and implores you not to tell anybody. I describe the NPC's dialogue. I give an outline of what that character has to say rather than trying to, trying to narrate exactly their words. With this approach, it's critical that you describe both the character's attitudes and their emotions. When you're using indirect dialogue, because you're not using tone of voice or body language either, you really need to drive home for your players with your descriptions what this character is feeling, what their thoughts are. Her face flushes red with embarrassment and she mutters an apology. He shoots you a look of pure anger. 
and makes it known that you have to comply or face the consequences. It's up to you to convey that NPC's mood and to clearly convey to the players their emotions and intent. And then you draw on that intent to form a description of how that character is going to act and how others would perceive it. This is why I spend so much of my DM prep time on NPCs, because I can just think about what this character would do and then describe what I see in my mind without having to come up with natural sounding dialogue. I just focus on the mental image of the character and then tell everybody what that character does and how they do it. And then again, this is important, how everyone else would perceive their intent. When I do use direct dialogue, when I speak in character, I go all out, including the voice, the body language, the mannerisms. But I tend to reserve this only for two occasions. When I'm introducing an important NPC or when I'm delivering their pre-written lines of dialogue. And I say it for those two occasions because those things contain subtext. They have dramatic weight or they reveal something about that person's character. In the, the Smith example from before, I might give him one line of dialogue. You ever been so desperate you didn't know what to do? It reinforces the key bits of that little exchange that the Smith is guilty, but he's remorseful at the same time. It shines a light on a bit of his character. And that switch from talking in indirect dialogue to putting on the character voice and speaking in character directly is a big hint to the players that this is important. Pay attention. I know DMs hate it when players don't pick up on their clues. And you can't blame them. There's a lot of stuff that gets said. But by doing this, by switching over to the dramatic uh, character voice, you're putting a big old blue paw print on it saying, hey, pay attention, this is important. Sometimes I even point it out to them right before I deliver the line of dialogue. I put it on the face and say, okay, well, what he would say is, and that really reinforces the idea that you're just hearing from this NPC's point of view. You're just hearing their perspective, not necessarily the whole capital T truth. One other time that I'll always use direct dialogue when I'll always speak in character is when a player decides to speak in character. I'll usually respond back using a voice as that NPC to affirm that their choice is okay to say, yeah, this is something that it's cool here. But then I'll switch back to indirect because that's what I'm more comfortable with. Okay, I know you already got one history lesson in this video, but you stuck around this long so you can get another. Remember that scene in The Matrix when Neo goes to see the Oracle? You know what that means? Latin means no thyself. Yeah, that should have been in Greek, not Latin. That was inscribed at the Oracle at Delphi, not Rome. Anyway, there's another reason why using indirect dialogue at least is good for my game. And that reason is no thesepton. I know my strengths and my weaknesses as a DM, and I know that if I try to come up with realistic sounding dialogue on the fly, it usually falls flat. It sounds a little too forced or on the nose. In the real world, there's a big gulf between what people say and what they actually mean. And that difference is called subtext. Bad writing lacks subtext. You've all heard this. You've heard clunky dialogue before where something just sounds unbelievable or when a character says something that no person in the real world would ever talk like. You can't just have your characters announce how they feel. That makes me feel angry. I know that a big argument against using indirect dialogue is, oh, but it's so much less immersive. You're gonna lose your immersion. Well, for me, delivering bad dialogue is even worse. That snaps me right out of it faster than anything else. Delivering an eye rolling line of dialogue directly does a lot more to harm your immersion than describing someone's thoughts and feelings. After all, that's kind of what we do in the real world, right? More often than not, we don't put on a person's voice or use their exact words when telling a story. So if I know that I'm no good at creating real believable dialogue on the fly, why worry about it? There's so much other stuff that you're juggling as the DM. And so letting myself, you know, just pass this off, not worry about it, it frees up so much mental bandwidth so I can focus on other things. Now, just because I don't use voices when I use indirect third person role play, doesn't mean that my scenes go like this. The guard won't let you into the kitchen. I rolled to persuade him. Okay, roll. 16. All right, he lets you in. No, I always ask, how do you persuade them? I always make my players, or I try to always get my players to describe their character's actions, even if they're doing their words indirectly. I appeal to the guard's sense of charity and ask him to take pity on us poor beggars. That will do it because they still convey the attitudes and the emotions of their words. 
even if they didn't act it out. Even third person indirect role play should be driven between the back and forth between characters. Okay, now for the hack, right? In my opinion, dice should only come into play when the outcome of a conversation is uncertain. And sometimes a simple contest is enough. You know, whether or not you can lie to the guard about where the fire came from. But what about a more complex negotiation or a more difficult conversation? Well, for something like that, I'm gonna go ahead and use the chase rules. What? Yeah, I'm gonna run the conversation like a chase from the DMG. I'm gonna hack those rules. You and your listener start with a certain distance between yourselves. And I rate that distance between one and five based on what you want. Getting invited to the, the Count's Fancy Ball or Rohan sending aid to Gondor. And what the listener wants to avoid becoming embarrassed, to avoid becoming a patsy. And a situation that's like a four out of five, the person just needs a slight nudge. But a one out of five, the listener's gonna need a whole lot of convincing. A character can attempt to influence the listener one plus the charisma modifier times. And for a group, I'd probably use the highest character's charisma mod for the party. The player makes an ability check with the base DC equal to the listener's charisma or wisdom if they're trying to trick or intimidate them. And you can adjust the DC based on the particular situation. For example, if you're trying to use deception, you would lower the DC if that person trusts you and raise it if they distrust you. For persuasion, you would lower the DC if what you're proposing is agreeable to the listener, and you would raise the DC if they find it disagreeable or harmful. If you're intimidating them, you lower the DC if you're threatening something that they find weak or they're really attached to. And then you raise the intimidation DC if what you're trying to get them to do would harm them or bring them danger. If the player passes the check, they close the distance and the listener gets closer to acting in their interests. They gain influence. They go from a three out of five to a four out of five. On a fail, they would gain disdain and move the other way. And here's where it gets cool. If they fail by 10 or more, I add a complication. Somebody gets angry. You've inadvertently dragged in a family member or somebody close to them. There was a miscommunication and misunderstanding. In a way, this kind of mimics the fourth edition style skills challenges. NPCs are people too, so I always give them at least two of the following. A fear, a desire, a regret, or a secret. This is handy too when running conversations because it can give you some guidelines for how to deal with dice rolls. For example, if you hit an NPC's fear when you're trying to intimidate them, you would gain advantage. Or if you somehow speak to one of their hidden desires, you would gain advantage when persuading them. That is, if you hit an NPC's fear when intimidating them, you'd gain advantage. Or if you somehow speak to an NPC's desire when persuading them, you'd gain advantage. NPCs also have certain personality traits too. Some NPCs might be vulnerable to flattery and some NPCs might be headstrong and cocky and immune to being intimidated. Yeah, so that's pretty much the video, folks. Uh, real fast, we just went over all the cool stuff that you can do. We went over a whole lot. We went over the distinctions between the different types of roleplay, how there's actually four, not just two. I gave you some tips on how to do third person indirect roleplay better. And we also talked about why certain players would do first versus third person. So if you like this vid, you know what to do. And let me know what you think about these things in the comments below. There are more cool stories from the sack of Rome about how Camillus went from an exile to dictator and about how a group of elite Gaelic commandos got foiled by a flock of geese.